Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, this is a pretty technical presentation um, and demo about microservices with Komunda. Um, I just, I'm going to put it, say up front, this is not a uh, ZB. Uh, Burned will uh, present ZB in a little while. Um, so uh, this is really focused on Komunda and um, what we can kind of do with Komunda in a microservice uh, based architecture. Um, and uh, some of the topics we'll go over. Um, I just, I really want to focus on uh, kind of resilience and some of the things we might be able to do to make our system resilient, um, some pitfalls that we might encounter, um, and then talk about some of the, maybe some of the principles also around microservices, uh, you know, like containing our services in a bounded context um, and uh, <clears throat> uh, observability and documentation and how BPMN is uh, really good at doing that. Um, and uh, maybe a little bit about breaking rules and when we, want, when, we, when we break rules, why we break rules, and how we can kind of do that with Komunda. Um, so uh, I'm Paul, and I love to ski. And this is me at the top of Loveland Pass, about 13,000 feet. It's my fun picture. Uh, so we had a, a lot of customers um, doing kind of distributed systems in different ways, in different fashions uh, with Komunda and uh, kind of leveraging the platform. And uh, they're, uh, they're really, uh, there, there's kind of a lot of different ways. Uh, Komunda is a very flexible tool, so it could be deployed and, um, you know, leveraged in a lot of, uh, a lot of ways uh, to allow you to kind of achieve your goals. Um, so talking a little bit about resilience, uh, one of the things about uh, these distributed systems is there are just certain things we cannot control. Um, you know, it's kind of like this, you know, this image here is we've got, you know, our little house out there that's safe and, and warm, um, but outside in, in the world, things can get very rough and we don't really necessarily, uh, you know, we're not able to control all those factors. And so what, what can we do? Um, well, basically what we can do is we can accept failure, right? We can say things are gonna happen, things are gonna fail, and, and how can we deal with that? How can we deal with those kinds of failures? Um, well, one of the things we can do is we can keep those failures local. We can keep those failures bounded within a, a, a service context. Um, so some of these kind of failures that we might encounter are things like uh, our client doesn't receive a message back from our service, or um, our, you know, our service fails for some reason in some unexpected way and we didn't deal with it well. Um, or maybe the message just never gets to the service. Uh, so, again, what, what, what can we, how, can we, how do we handle that sort of thing? How can we uh, help to contain that and, and manage that failure? Um, we can, again, put our, our service within this bounded context. Um, and this is quite easy to do with Komunda because, um, because of the flexibility of the engine, because it's a lightweight, um, library, essentially, uh, we can put our BPM, we can contain our BPM right inside a service context, and we can see what's happening in that context um, within our BPMN, and we can model that out very quickly and easily. Um, okay, so again, uh, our check-in process here, we have a uh, BPMN that's inside this context, um, and because of it, because because it's available, because it's uh, um, very observable, it's very easy to see what's happening in here. We can make very clear decisions about um, when something does go wrong, what we want to do. For instance, um, you know, if we generated a barcode and something went wrong in that barcode generation, uh, we can choose with Komunda. Uh, what we want to do. Do we want to retry? Do we want to uh, 
um, send, the, uh, send the user back an, a message saying, or the service or the user back a message saying, you know, hey, we'll send, well, we're gonna send you a 202 back and we're gonna, we're gonna tell you, okay, well, maybe this service um, has, so, you know, we, we, we've got it under control, so uh, we can, uh, you can just go about with what you're doing and we'll figure out what we need to do and then, and then uh, you know, when, when things are done, we're gonna send you your, your boarding pass, for instance, in this case. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> another way to kind of create resilience within a system um, is to not let your whole system blow up. For instance, uh, the barcode generator broke. Well, we don't want that to take down our whole system. So what we can do is uh, create um, what's called a circuit breaker. And that circuit breaker kind of stops that, that, uh, uh, <clears throat> that failure from cascading through the whole system, right? And there's several different uh, methods to create a cir circuit breaker, but these can be implemented in Komunda fairly easily. Um, kind of the next step is, well, well we've stopped, we've stopped uh, you know, the circuit breaker from, uh, you know, the circuit breaker has stopped our system from completely failing, but maybe we haven't been able to give the service back or the user back um, something really useful. So the next step is, well, let's actually, you know, let, let's now give the user back a better experience than they would have had if they, uh, if they, uh, you know, just instead of just getting a server error or something like that. Okay, um, so we can do that by do using the statefulness of the, the uh, process engine, right? So we have the state machine that we've embedded into our check-in process. Our check-in process um, kind of contains our barcode generator, right? It kinda, it, there's a little bit of an orchestration going on here, and that orchestration is you know, controlling what the barcode generator does. So our, doing a stateful retry is possible. So, and you can do that in several ways um, in Komunda. You can do it explicitly, and you could set up you know, some sort of explicit flow that does a stateful retry, or you can use kind of more subtle mechanisms in Komunda to do a stateful retry. But essentially what we could do is, again, we could pass back that message like saying, hey, uh, you know, something, maybe something went wrong, you know, we'll contact you in five minutes because we're trying to fix the problem internally. You know? and give that user back something more, something more useful. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna try to go into the live demo portion here. Um, I'd actually like, this is a little bit interactive, so if anybody has a uh, cell phone they, they would like to use, um, can they text this to see uh, this in action? We'll see if it's still working. <laughs> yes. Okay, has anybody gotten any responses back? Sure. Cool. Okay, so um, if you, if you, so you might have seen like, hello, nice to hear from you um, on this glorious day, and then you can ask a question like, where can I get a cheeseburger in Berlin, right? Okay, so there's kind of two different messages that came through there, and um, we can kind of talk a little bit about how that works, but if you actually went a little bit further, and you tried to ask a question, uh, Unless you ask, actually ask the exact question, something would get broken, right? It didn't answer. Right. Okay. So the reason that the reason that doesn't work is because 
there's a natural language processor in the background here, and that natural language processor hasn't been trained on anything and everything, right? So I'd have to actually tell the natural language processor about beer so, so it knows. Um, but those kind of things, like, they happen all the time in these systems. Um, and so, you know, how do we go about, um, you know, figuring out, oh, this, this didn't happen, that was not a, that's not a good response to you, right? Nothing is not a good response. We'd want to maybe do something like, I don't understand, sorry, I don't understand this. Maybe ask a different question. Um, so what we can do um, in, in these kinds of situations is we could use timers. Um, for instance, that's kind of what happened here is like, in, in your case, we saw that, you know, the, the, we, we sent a message, um, something failed, and then nothing came back. And we just want to avoid that experience. And we can do that with, uh, with BPMN. So how can we do that? Uh, <clears throat> well, of course, you can, because you can, uh, because, of the, because we have this stateful uh, um, engine that's embedded within our process, um, we can kind of see what's happening and we can react to those kinds of things. Right? So it's easy to handle time. Um, and in this case, if nothing happened within 30 seconds, then I'd probably want to be able to react to, to, to that, right? And send you back something saying, oh, well, nothing happened. Okay. Or maybe call a different instance of a process. Yeah, exactly. Okay, um, so let's talk a little bit, uh, kind of switch gears just a little bit here, but we're gonna talk about uh, <clears throat> um, sort of how to handle state within the system, how to handle uh, consistency in the system, and, and, and where we want that um, to sort of, how, how we want that to kind of be leveraged. Um, again, one of the nice things about using Komunda is we're, we kind of have the ability to, to do, we kind of have the best of both worlds. Um, we have the ability to use an ACID transaction like within, a, within, the, within the boundaries of a service and uh, you know, have a very stateful system, um, or we can do something that's more distributed. We don't have to necessarily um, uh, keep our service, you know, keep all of the state in one, in, in, uh, of our whole system in one place. Um, and for instance, uh, um, for in this case, if we had a failure, right, we want to roll back that whole, that whole transaction. Um, but in many cases, when we're working in uh, distributed systems, we can't do that because we have multiple services doing different things and we need to be able to roll back those, those different services that happened um, you know, in a distributed fashion. And so, what we may want to do is uh, you know, take be able to actually go through each service and tell it when, when it needs to roll back and where it needs and what it needs to roll back. And so, uh, um, BPMN has a, a, a method to do this. It's called compensation. Um, it's very useful, very handy. Um, and that compensation uh, is also kind of known in the microservice world as the saga pattern. Um, and what you'd see here is uh, this is kind of a very simple example of it, um, but you know our person service did something, and and then you know checked in, and then the barcode generation failed. We captured that failure, and then we kind of kicked off um, the the compensation, and the compensation will automatically go back through each service and tell it what exactly it needs to roll back. So that's kind of what would happen. That's probably a question that we should, we should, we can talk about after. That's okay, that's kind of a big, 
question. There's a lot of, there's a lot packed in there. By the compensation catch events, right? Yeah. And which of these two will capture that compensation? They'll both capture it. Both. It just knows. It knows to roll them back automatically. There is a way, there are ways to model it so that you could explicitly tell it, I want you to do this compensation first, this compensation, but this, in this instance, when this is thrown, it will, it, anything that's been executed, compensation will automatically roll it back backwards in reverse oh, order. Back it will automatically roll back in reverse order. It goes in the reverse direction, yep, by default, yep. Yeah, and there again, there is a way, there are ways to explicitly tell the compensation how to roll back in, in BPMN. Yep. <laughs> we, can, we can talk about that. Um, okay, so, um, so what I showed you was a, the demo was a uh, choreography approach um, and what's happening in this approach, in, 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 this, in, in that system, was essentially you text, um, the text went to a node app, the node app put a message on a queue, and uh, the queue then, uh, you know, that, that message kind of got passed down through different services. There's actually several uh, node applications, and there's a couple BPMN diagrams, uh, or <laughs> processes, um, that are um, making the conversations happen. Um, and the interesting thing about uh, the choreography approach is it's very flexible, um, it's very you know, scalable, um, but it has a lot of complications. Um, it, it's a complicated system, and some of the, you lose a little bit of the visibility um, that you might have if you took a, you know, an orchestration type approach. Um, so you can see that, uh, yeah, so our BPMN essentially, again, is um, every, at every step in, this, in that process of getting a message, um, it's putting something on a queue and then it's, it's essentially pulling it off a queue. And so we're kind of, in, in some sense though, the queue becomes a bit of an orchestrator. It's a very loose orchestrator, a very flexible orchestrator, but it does. And I'm actually using topics here um, and I can, you can use some patterns, and, some patterns and topics to kind of like help that orchestration along, um, but it, it you, you, you see that you can get the, you get very limited very quickly if you want to do um, any kind of orchestration in, in a, you know, in a more fine-grained sense. And that might be completely okay, depending on, you know, what, what you need to do. Uh, so I want to talk about the other kind of side of this is the, uh, the choreography side and how we could kind of do that with Kamunda um, and, uh, um, a little, little bit about architecture first. The way this is architected is essentially everything um, kind of sits in, in a service within its own service boundaries. Um, I'm using a Spring Boot application and Kamunda and the REST APIs um, along with the message bus um, in, this, in, in kind of the system you just saw. Um, and uh, you know, yeah, we've got, you know, we still have our own database which kind of you know, fits into that bounded context model. Everything's got its own data source. Um, but we could kind of flip that around with Kamunda, which is neat. Um, so if you don't want to use one programming language or a scripting language inside of Kamunda and you want to kind of like flip the, uh, the, the paradigm around, um, you can still have your service, you can still have Kamunda, and you can still live in the bounded context, but you can actually use what's called, what are called external tasks, and those external tasks um, can be any kind of client, right? It could be a... Uh, Node client, it can be a C sharp client, it could be a uh, you know whatever Python, whatever you're, whatever you're interested in. There are a few. We we actually have uh, um, projects for some kinds of clients, especially in seven nine. We've expanded our external task clients. Um, so how does that look um, from the actually modeling perspective? Um, so you can do uh, what's called an external task, it's very simple in Kamunda to, to actually set it up. It, it looks like a normal service task, um, but you just mark it with the implementation of external. Um, you provide a topic, and that topic is what essentially Kamunda will listen to, um, that instance of Kamunda would listen to, right? And then we just have to point Kamunda 
at that instance, or I'm sorry, you have to point your service at that instance of Komunda and ask for tasks on that topic. Your client is sending the request, right? Your client is pulling Komunda, essentially, um, for external tasks. And that's kind of what we're showing here, is that we've got our, uh, we've got our validate address external task. That is essentially queued up in, commun in Komunda. Um, and then your, your worker, which let's say it's a Node.js app, right, is pulling Komunda for work on that topic. So you could have thousands of workflows that have gotten to this state, right? And then, or I'm sorry, to this state, right? And you've got all these tasks queued up. The worker then is pulling Komunda and saying, do you have any work for me? Oh, I've got 500 processes. I've got 500 processes that are at this place. Go do the work for those 500 processes and then complete. And when your worker is done, it can complete those tasks and all those 500 processes would move on. So it's a way of kind of, uh, you know, scaling out the, 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 uh, the work um, while also being able to kind of be like um, Yes, it's a it's a it's a wait state. Uh, it's a wait state. Yeah, external is a wait state. So you've ha you have five hundred or thousand or whatever wor uh, processes working at that. Oh, you have to tell your worker where the Komunda engine is. Oh, I have to provide the endpoint. Yes, you have to provide the endpoint. All of them that are... Whichever ones you want to do. Yeah, so if you have them deployed in different, in different uh, applications, each application has to be able to, you know, each, let's say, server, you have to tell the worker where that, where that endpoint is. So yeah. In your worker. Yeah. How, how do I do that? Uh, I mean, that's up to you. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of ways to do that. I mean, you could do it through the Java API as well if you wanted to, well, but. Why not the, uh, the task validation be listening to the uh, topic to get into the task? So instead of the, the worker has to go to this uh, destination, then the worker has to. So you can, you can do that, but that's a different, that's a different, uh, parent, yeah. You can do that. There's the, the not, you can't do that, but that's not an external task worker. Yes, yeah, so you can filter what, which ones you want to take. Yeah, you can prioritize, you can filter, there's a bunch of different options as far as like what you want to actually do. You can do it by variables, you can do it by, by key business key or UUIDs or something like that. Yep. This could also be used as a pattern for injecting external data into the process, like deploying a change ring as well. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so uh, I kind of went through this, I think, already, but yeah, this is essentially kind of explaining what we just, we, what we just talked about. Um, you know, uh, you could push, you can push if you wanted to, right? Sort of like, I'm gonna do this I'm in, and go do it and then wait for their response, right? Or you could push to some sort of queue or something like that. Um, but uh, this is what we would be doing if we were, right, if we're um, using external tasks. We're pulling those tasks and then completing them, right? Could be, potentially. As far as, as, as far as the uh, external tasks? Yeah. The first one. Oh, this one? Well, I mean, you, whatever you're, 
whatever you want your service task to do. So if this is a service task, right, whatever that service task needs to do, you're gonna have to tell your code how to do that, right? I mean, if, if you don't do anything, then it would just flow through that node. What's that? What advantages? Um, well, I, I so the I think the two biggest advantages are one, you don't have to write your code in any specific language. You can if you say you're a Ruby shop, right, and you want to use workflow. Now you can use external tasks and just write Ruby code, just like you've been writing before, and doing the actual work in your Ruby applications, and then, and then you just complete the task. So you're kind of like, it's, it's, it's sort of like a poly approach to programming with Komunda, right? Um, and then it is very scalable. It's, it's very performant because the, the Komunda is not really doing anything but keeping the state of where you're at, right? So you could write your services to be, to do whatever they need to do in whatever language that, or whatever technology that best suits that service, and then just, keep state in Komunda. So the push model is like the truth of the yeah. I mean, I've been wrestling with this. To my mind, the advantage of the control model is you can use the handlers across different uh, processes like you said before. So it's very easy to do that. The fact that it becomes hard to basically segregate, basically, you, you, you would have to have a unique queue name for all your, for all your different processes, otherwise mm -hmm. it's very difficult to tell. Yep. That's true. Uh, so, uh, in any case, uh, going back to the sort of like the, the orchestration versus uh, <laughs> um, uh, choreography approach, almost I almost out of time, um, or am I out of time? Two more minutes. Okay. So the uh, orchestration approach versus the choreography approach um, is, of course, you know, with the choreography, um, you know, we had to we had to put things on the queue. We had to figure out like what was on the queue. Um, where it lives, where things might have gone wrong. Um, it's not really explicit um, exactly what has happened and where it's happened. Um, if we take a more choreography approach, or a more orchestration approach, um, um, which the app actually works in this approach as well, um, we can actually, we put our messages into the Komunda orchestration flow. The flow um, can, you know, do, use things like external tasks um, to, you know, say send messages, um, do NL, you know, do the end natural language processing, um, still using the external task client that I that I that I had uh, that I'd created for the other approach, um, and you know, in this case though, now I'm waiting here for this to for this to be completed, right? Um, and then waiting for an actual message. And I actually don't do this, but I just wanted to kind of illustrate this a little bit um, better, <laughs> um, but. Uh, I just wanted to illustrate the fact that we could wait for this message to come back because you can actually do the messaging within the external task client. Um, but um, then save the message you know, to a database or whatever, um, and I actually save it to a MongoDB store, uh, and then, uh, but it also persists within Komunda um, because I've actually got a variable in the workflow that is our message. Uh, and then of course, here is an example of using a timer. Uh, and the timer in this case would, you know, if this didn't work, if this message didn't work, you know, that for some reason that, that like nothing came back, then my timer says, oh, well, go back and do something, right? And send the user something else, some other message or the service. Um, and then of course, I can see exactly where things are going on because there's essentially complete observability and transparency within the entire system now. So that's pretty much it. What's that? Oh, I went through the whole, the whole, that was the whole thing, external tasks and everything. Yeah. That was a setup. Okay.
Wasn't that? Uh, uh, yeah, oh, okay. Well, I'll take some questions. Then. Well, well, let me let me let me actually let me actually show something else. So. Um, I'm actually glad that I have a little extra time. So this is the process for, uh, you know, for the, for the uh, orchestration application, and you can I go, I'll go through it a little bit here. Um, so, oh, lost it. So in this case, we parse entities, and I actually use a decision table um, to figure out the intent of those entities. Those entities came from a different system. Um, they came from this WIT application. Uh, so this is WIT AI is a natural language processor. It's not actually a very good one, um, but it's free and it's pretty easy to use. Um, but again, I could show you like, we, we have this food intent and that's got cheeseburger in it and sushi. That's pretty much the only thing I didn't put in there. I could have listed, I could have pulled a whole list put a whole list of stuff in there. Um, you know, every single food that exists or something, and then you wouldn't have gotten that error. Um, but I wanted to purposely get that error. Uh, so the message, uh, essentially, I have an external task worker that calls WIT, does the natural language processing, and then um, puts that onto the queue. And in the queue, I've got a uh, exchange that actually looks for, uh, for food, that's waiting for food, essentially. Uh, and then um, in Cockpit, this is just one application uh, that actually is part of this process. And this one does the specific processing of, you know, uh, essentially food type events. Uh, and uh, let's take a step back too and look at this a little bit slightly bit higher level. Um, again, you can see here we've got, make this a little bit bigger. So I'm actually breaking some, breaking some rules here, but it's very like um, intentional. And we can see um, when we want to break rules with BPMN and why we're breaking those rules. And the reason I wanted to break the rules is because I've got these two processes here, and I actually wanted this process to wait for a message, because I wanted this to be completed first. If you actually went through that, the demo, if you actually texted and, 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 and said, where is a cheeseburger in Denver, and then it would ask your name, right? And I actually wanted to get your name before this went off, okay? Um, and then there's another, there would be another problem, because if you, if, you didn't, if you didn't put your name in, this thing would just wait forever, right? So we don't want it to wait forever. Um, and that's where, again, a timer would come in to play, and so, I intentionally broke the rules there. I didn't put something back onto the message queue. I am actually communicating between these processes. In my organization, uh, you're not supposed to do that, right? And so I solved that problem by right here, it's a slightly different view of that same workflow, but I put a timer on that. It's like that waiting for that message. And now, if you didn't put your name in, it would just wait five seconds and then it would send a message back to you. Um, again, so in this, in, this, uh, in this demo, I've got external task workers um, that are doing stuff. Actually, not external task workers in this presentation because there's no, there's, these aren't external tasks. Um, but essentially, the queue is kind of working as an external task mechanism, right? Um, thing, something's coming into this, um, a message is coming in either from a phone or a chat client. Um, sorry if you can't see this, let me uh, make that a little bit bigger. So essentially, something, uh, a message is coming in from somewhere, some client. Um, it's getting queued up on the queue, um, and then another, essentially, uh, another worker 
is picking something up off that queue. It's just starting a workflow. Maybe I can show it better here. The workflow um, goes through its processing and figures out what it needs to do, um, and then puts a message back on the queue. And the, the flexibility here in the, of this approach is that like, you can be putting stuff, taking stuff and putting stuff on and off queues anywhere you want to, right? And then taking that and doing something with that, something on that queue, right? You're not limited by waiting, you know, by a process that has to, has to take in a certain, um, you know, that has uh, a database behind it essentially and, um, you know, because right here in the, in, the, in, the, in the orchestration approach, we'd have a process model, um, as I showed you in the other slide, uh, that waits for certain things to happen. So in any case, I guess the thing I really wanted to uh, instill here was that uh, using these different approaches, you can, uh, you know, you can do choreography or you can do orchestration and probably something somewhere in the middle is where, uh, you know, where things really work in, in a uh, production system. Um, but uh, also because BPMN is very, it's very easy to see what's happening in your BPMN, um, you know, you can, you can break rules when you need to and do things that are maybe not exactly the fit of whatever your, you know, your guidelines for microservices, um, which don't necessarily always work um, in real world scenarios, but you can do it, you know, very clearly and um, you can understand why you did it and it's sort of like not unintentional. It's an intentional breaking of the rules and uh, it can, uh, it really allows you to, uh, um, to kind of understand where your tech debt is, essentially. Okay. Um, so again, we can kind of dig in here if we wanted to, and it's another, so even though we've got, we're doing the more choreo choreography approach, um, we can still see what's happening, for instance, in the context of our message, right, of, of uh, orchestrating the actual messaging. So the orchestration of the actual messaging um, is still happening within Komunda, and we can really kind of introspect that specific piece of the system. So that's kind of nice about being able to like put a process inside of a bounded context and still use a lot of, you know, all the, uh, all the power of a state machine within that bounded context and this is just one example, is like now I know where my message went to within this choreographed system, and um, I can kind of see, you know, who sent this message, you know, or, you know, what, what was sort of the context of this particular, you know, execution. So that's pretty much it. Any other questions? <laughs> This is actually historical. This is, these are, this is something that happened already. It went all the way through in that instance. Yep, enterprise, enterprise cockpit. There is, you can, in, in uh, community cockpit, you can see some information about running workflows, but no historical. I've heard of that, but I, don't, I haven't actually seen it. But you, you, there is no reason you wouldn't be able to use like a voice natural language processor with this. This is a, you know, an example of text, but yeah. If you had some like voice. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of fun. Uh, it actually, let, BPMN lends itself well to orchestrating this sort of thing. Um, I've, I've actually used a couple other systems like Watson and Watson has an Alchemy, this is the Alchemy API, which has this 
really bad process diagramming system for doing this. Yeah. Yeah, and the tricky part about doing this and what I'm sure anybody that's building a real system is, it's like it's easy to, to sort of like ask a question or you know, send a message and get a response back right away. But when you have to do a more complex orchestration, then what happens? How do you do that? You know, and you can't, that's the, the real power here is whether you're doing text, you know, messaging, you know, <laughs> this kind of messaging, or you're doing event-driven systems or whatever, you have the ability to really take it to that, like, more deeper, more complicated, you know, level. It will wait there. You could, uh, I mean, there's sort of like you can uh, you could set a timer on the task. There's a timer on the fetch and lock, but the process won't move forward. And I think you're asking, will it? Will the process move forward if if it doesn't? Exactly, it would just go back to being so put in the queue. The no, it's so it, it, a fetch and lock will last for a certain amount of time and you can configure that, but the task would just stay there until another process came, uh, came by and picked it up and finished it, completed it. And that's, that's what we want to happen. But if you, you can explicitly in BPMN tell it, I want you to move on with a timer. So you could do an interrupting timer on that task and then you know, flow away from that task if it didn't get completed in whatever, you know, a minute or something. So it's pretty easy to do that. It's not, there's no like, it's not, I would say default is the, you know, is the way I would put it. You, you have to explicitly tell it to move on. Yeah, yeah, you can filter. So if you had like a, let's say you had like a unique identifier on the task, you could, fil you could fetch by that unique identifier and only pull one task. Yeah, we can talk about it. Anything else? Is there like a retry thing? Does that work? I thought there was a retry setting also. Yep. Yeah, there's a retry. So if you had a service task and you wanted to, you know, it failed, and you wanted, you wanted to do three retries, yes, you could do. So you could explain. That's sort of like the, you know, like the implicit way of doing it. But there's, you could do it more explicitly as well with timer, but yeah. So if you're the processor, you say if I wanted to slow the process down to a processor, that was fine, but you didn't have that feature for media, right? Yes. Or you just had it uh, uh, If you're, you know, you can search across, yes, you can search across multiple definitions. 